Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Textry. Make yourself a cup of tea, make yourself a cup of coffee or other beverage of your choice. Maybe don't drink a hot beverage if you're driving. Some of you are listening while driving apparently somewhere, so maybe let's not do that. Anyway, today we will be reading some of Marilyn Monroe's poetry Yes, you heard that correctly. This is a little fact about her that is just not really common knowledge. But she left behind a lot of personal writings, notebooks, notes, little poems, just pieces of text that are not really fiction, but they're not necessarily just notes either. I think she probably would not consider it poetry, but it does sound very poetic to me, especially later on in her life. So we will be looking at her writings throughout different periods in her life. Some were written at the height of her career. Some were written as she was dealing with some personal issues. Now, not gonna lie, it does feel a little invasive and morally dubious at best that they went through her personal writings after she passed and they just published them. But A, she has passed almost 70 years ago, which I think gives us enough historical perspective to look at these writings with a clear conscience, basically. And B, Considering that most people nowadays have a really flat and uninteresting image of her and they just don't understand who she was, after all this time she's still being caged in this like dumb, sexy, blonde stereotype, I feel like it's more about doing her justice than snooping around. So that's how I justify it just to not feel too invasive because I would probably hate it if someone went after my personal diaries but if I was already gone for so long I would probably not haunt that person but I just want to put it out there in case there is a Marilyn Monroe ghost somewhere. <laughs> so before we delve into it let me just let you know that Marilyn was as most of us know a very troubled person and there will be some mentions of of suicidal thoughts and mental health issues so if you want to click away now it's completely fine and i'll see you in the next episode and those of you that are staying let's jump into it so apart from being a star basically and being a very prolific actress marilyn was also incredibly intellectual it does not at all in my opinion translate to most of her on-screen roles at least the ones that people remember the most at least the ones that are like iconic roles of hers she was an avid reader there are so many photos of her just reading very complex alternative books let's say uh, she was surrounded by literally the most intelligent people of the era. She was close friends with many of them. She had so many deep conversations with them that they still talked about years after she passed. She just had a much deeper outlook on life than, than the gentleman preferred blondes persona or uh, how to marry a millionaire characters would lead you to believe. Not gonna lie, a lot of her writings are just incredibly sad and... Damn, like I wish she received the help she needed because people around her did not really treat her right either. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So a lot of her notes, a lot of her little poetic works were just written on scraps of paper. Like let's say you used to get paper from the hotel that you were staying at just so you could like write little letters to your friends. There is a lot of that. There is a lot of just scraps of paper with her thoughts on it. And it sometimes gets a little mixed with like movie lines that she was practicing or quotes from something so sometimes it's difficult to understand what she meant or what it actually is but 90% of the cases I do believe that it was her actual like personal thoughts so this one is not dated it doesn't have a date so we don't know when she wrote it and it was on a scrap of paper I can't really stand human beings sometimes I know they all have their problems as I have mine but I'm really too tired for it trying to understand, making allowances, seeing certain things that just weary me. So this is just a taster. Now, she has also been attending a lot of acting classes. So a lot of her texts are about acting techniques or how she feels about being an actress. So I think that's also very interesting because it brings us a perspective of her as an actress that is trying to perfect her craft. 
alone, five exclamation marks. I am alone. I am always alone, no matter what. I don't even know what the context was. Maybe it was just a note that she made during one of those classes where it could have been something completely different. It could have been about her ability to build a character. Maybe it was about how she has to depend on herself in acting. But regardless of what the context was, you cannot help but think about how this quote relates to herself as a persona or like her personal life. The whole thing, it's just, that's the most tragic thing about her. Like despite being surrounded by people almost every moment of her life, she, she probably felt alone most of the time. What do I believe in? What is truth? I believe in myself. Even my most delicate, intangible feelings. In the end, everything is intangible. My most precious liquid must never spill. Don't spill your precious liquid. Life force. They are all my feelings, no matter what. See, this is what I meant. Like, just everything about her was so poetic. I can't tell if it's good poetry or bad poetry, but it's just the way she used words to describe her feelings, to describe what she saw. I think it's beautiful either way. Actress must have no mouth, no feet, shoulder, girdle hangs light, hanging so loose, everything. Focus my thought on the partner, feeling in the end of my fingers. So this was all from early 50s. Now, this notebook that I'm going to read right now, I mean, it's not the actual notebook. I don't own Marilyn Monroe's notebooks, but notes from this notebook are dated 1955. And what's interesting, she mentions her religious aunt, Ida Martin, as a person that still has negative influence on her, even though... She's long gone from her life. Ida, I have still been obeying her. It's not only harmful for me to do so, but unreality. Because in my work, I don't want to obey her any longer. And I can do my work as fully as I wish since I was a small child. In fact, first desire was to be an actress. And I spent years play acting until I had jobs. I have. I will not be punished or trying to hide it, enjoying myself as fully as I wish or want to. I will be as sensitive as I am, without being ashamed for it." It does sound like she's pretty self-aware in terms of referring to herself as sensitive, because I'm assuming that's what she heard all the time. And she did seem like a very sensitive person. To know reality or things as they are, than to have not to know and to have few illusions as possible. She does have a lot of typos in her text, which I think makes it even more endearing because you can tell she wasn't writing it for anyone to ever read, which makes me feel awful. But I'm just saying that she was not doing it to like sell her work or publish it anywhere. She did, probably did not even consider herself to be able to do that. So it's completely innocent writings that she did not even care if they're written properly or not. And I think that's even more authentic and that's even more moving in a way because it's just like her pure thoughts. Working, doing my tasks that I have set for myself. On the stage, I will not be punished for it or be whipped or be threatened or not be loved or sent to hell to burn with bad people, or feeling that I am also bad, or be afraid or ashamed of my genitals, being exposed, known and seen, so what? Or colors, or screaming, or doing nothing, or ashamed of my sensitive feelings. They are reality. And I do have feeling, very strongly sexed feeling, since a small child. Think of all the things I felt then. We will probably never know what she what she's referring to exactly, but it does feel like, at least in writing, she wanted to retain as little autonomy as she had left, but she wanted to still be able to make decisions for herself and stand up for herself, which I think is something that her very like soft persona that we see, even in the interviews from the era, definitely does not show. 
I can and will help myself and work on things analytically, no matter how painful. If I forget things the unconscious wants to forget, I will only try to remember. Discipline concentration. My body is my body, every part of it. So the first quote I think is very relatable to anyone that's ever done therapy, because you cannot get to the good stuff without digging through the painful stuff first. And she is pumping herself up to stay and to be able to work through that, to get to the actually, like to the actual work. But to do that, she first has to face her past. Feel what I feel within myself. That is trying to become aware of it. Also what I feel in others. Not being ashamed of my feeling, thoughts or ideas. Realize the thing that they are. So again, this whole notebook seems like her notes on improving herself, on working on herself, on becoming less ashamed of how she feels, who she is as a person, in being more free to express herself. And reading this is just so sad because we know that she didn't have enough time to fully explore herself and to fully blossom into a woman that she probably could have been. So it's just a little heartbreaking because, I don't know, I just feel like she could have done it. Like reading this, there is so much determination. I'm pretty sure she could have done it, but it's just she ran out of time. Now, these texts are also from 1955 and they were written on the Waldorf Astoria Hotel letter paper, basically what they gave the guests. Sad sweet trees, I wish for you rest, but you must be wakeful. This is all on, on one page, by the way, there's a lot of notes here. What was that now, just a moment ago? From it was mine and now it's gone, like the swift movement of a moment, gone. Maybe I'll remember because it felt as though it started to be wonderful, only mine. So many lights in the darkness, making skeletons of buildings and life in the streets. What was it I thought about yesterday in the streets? Seems so far away long ago and moon so full and dark. It's better they told me as a child what it was, for I could not understand it now. Noises of impatience from cab drivers, always driving, who must drive, hot, dusty, icy streets, so they can eat and perhaps save for a vacation in which they can drive their wives all the way across the country to see her relatives. Then the river, the part made of Pepsi Cola, the park, thank God for the park. Yet I am not looking at these things, I'm looking for my lover. It's good they told me what the moon was when I was a child. This is so complex, like Rupi Kaur ain't got nothing on this. <laughs> The part of the river made of Pepsi Cola, that's so poetic, like Lana Del Rey taking notes. Then they told me what the moon was when I was a child. Thank God for the park. This is my favorite quote so far because I love parks and this is literally what goes through my mind every morning when I'm taking a walk or working out. Okay, I don't work out every morning, let's be real realistic here. But when I do, I d that goes through my mind. I'm like, thank God for parks. Thank God for this park. And I actually love parks. So a shout out to Marilyn because she knew what's up. But also the whole very like delicate atmosphere of this one. I, I really love this text. This is from 1956 after she married Arthur Miller and this is written on a company paper from Parkside House. My love sleeps besides me. In the faint light I see his manly jaw give way and the mouth of his boyhood returns. With a softness softer, its sensitiveness trembling, in stillness. His eyes must have looked out, wondrously from the cave of the little boy, when the things he did not understand, he forgot. But will he look like this when he is dead? Oh, unbearable fact, inevitable, yet sooner would I rather his love die than or him. Whew, that is deep. 
But I also love the fact that she was writing a poem about him as as he was sleeping next to her. This is so sweet. It also it almost makes me cry. Also knowing that he didn't treat her the best and she still wrote this sweet poem about how cute he, he looks when he's asleep is so cute. But even then, even a sweet moment like this was interrupted by her sudden thoughts of something awful, of him dying, basically. Which wasn't gonna happen anytime soon, but I guess you can't help those thoughts when you're actually really happy. The pain of his longing when he looks at another, like an unfulfillment since the day he was born. And I, in merciless pain, and with his pain of longing, when he looks at and loves another, like an unfulfillment of the day he was born, we must endure. I more sadly, because I can feel no joy. See, that that's what I meant. Like, she had really nice moments with him, and then he just looked at another woman. Dude, you were married to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I guess I have always been deeply terrified to really be someone's wife, since I know from life one cannot love another ever really. Again, this is the depth of thought that you would probably not expect watching her in Some Like It Hot, let's say. This all has an emotional weight of three elephants. <laughs> one on top of another. I don't know what else to say. Like, it gives you a glimpse of how heavy her, her life was, if that was her reasoning, but also it's incredible how many thoughts like this can a person have, and we just would never know if we didn't find those writings. It is not to be for granted. The old woman hides from her glass. The one she polishes so it won't be dusty daring sometimes to see her toothless gasp and if she perhaps very gently smiles she remembers her pain her pale chiffon dress that she wore on a windy afternoon when she walked where no one had ever been her clear-eyed baby who lived to die the woman's years have left the woman stares and stares in space this is an interesting one because she brings up age and in the next one you can tell that aging has been one of her worries as well. And I mean rightly so, like being the most beautiful woman in Hollywood at the time. There must have been incredible pressure on you retaining that look. And here is what she wrote. Where his eyes rest with pleasure, I want to still be. But time has changed the hold of that glance. Alas, how will I cope when I am even less youthful? Now, to end it on a more positive note, there is some kitchen-themed notes that she made, mostly like recipes or food that she had. So let's just read that, because I feel like with people like Marilyn that were so deeply troubled and so just so unhappy in a way... It's very sad to just focus on all that, but she obviously had a lot of happy moments in her life as well. She was successful, she was a businesswoman, she must have had a lot of moments when she was just like, wow, I did that. So let's just focus on something more positive for the end of this episode, which is basically her kitchen notes. Or this one in particular is just notes on just doing things at home. This is what she wrote down. Ask for Kitty and or Clyde, my white dishes, my old silver candle holders, my paintings, Dutch woman, big one, and drunken angels, get firewood, buy white toilet seat, buy hamper and or gold thing for bathroom and or thing for back of door for towels bottles etc buy lamps for bedroom also shades take kurt with me buy food stool and coffee table buy bar buy mirror at l and taylor's buy two chairs classic for in front of piano also serves for extra guest chairs Buy brass ashtrays, one for M, one for L, one for me. Buy chandeliers, one for hall, one for dining area. Take back the two glass silver things. Buy 12 linen napkins, silverware, for 12. 
Buy birthday present for Helen. Have Kurt paint places for chandeliers, also where railing broke. Have Milton and Kurt put pictures in hallway, help me arrange room and place. Have Kurt sew off legs of brass candle holders. <laughs> Dry clean comforter, have wash bathroom rugs, send out laundry. It's just a list, like a to-do list basically, but it's incredible because we sometimes tend to forget that Marilyn freaking Monroe did to-do lists as well. Like she had stuff to do. I don't know, like we just imagine them bathing in perfume and, and being glamorous, but they had lives. They had chandeliers, they had dry cleaning to collect. Okay, this one seems like a recipe, so let's unpack this, but I'm not actually sure if it's a full recipe, so let's go. No garlic, sourdough, French bread, soak in cold water, wring out, then shred. For chicken giblets, boil in water 5 to 10 minutes, liver, heart, then chop. One whole or half onion, chop and parsley four stalk celery chopped together. Following spices, put in rosemary. Thyme, bay leaf, oregano, poultry seasoning, salt, pepper. Grated parmesan cheese, one handful. Half LB, one fourth LB ground round. Put in frying pan, brown, no oil, then mix. Raisin, one and a half cups or more. Walnuts, chestnuts, peanuts, one cup chopped nuts. <laughs> one or two hard boiled eggs chopped, mixed together. Salt and pepper inside chicken or turkey, outside same and butter. <laughs> I'm actually not entirely sure if that makes sense in terms of being a meal or like a dish. So maybe it's different notes for different things. But if someone wants to try out Marilyn Monroe's recipes, then be my guest. Another one. Sew up or clamp birds. Put chicken or turkey in 350 oven. Roasting chicken cooks three or four LBs or larger 30 minute to one LB. Vinegar, oil, onion, spices, brown chicken or pheasant. Let cook in own juice, add little water as you go, half glass vinegar, put in when half done. Cooks two hours, put potatoes, mushroom, baton canned, peas, fresh. This actually sounds delicious. I'm not sure that's probably not the complete recipe, but the ingredients used just sound like something I would love to eat and I might try something like this actually. <laughs> so in case you were wondering how those texts even saw the light of day, basically when Marilyn Monroe passed away, all of her personal belongings went to Lee Strasberg that she was uh, a friend of and she took acting classes from. And when he passed away in 1982, his widow inherited all of these things. And like years later, she was just cleaning up and she found two boxes full of Marilyn freaking Monroe's writings, notebooks, letters, all that stuff. And she was like, what the hell do I do with this? So she went to Stanley Butchell, who was a family friend. And then he told Bernard comment about it. And then they, they compiled it into one single book of all of her notes. Again, knowing that she passed away so long ago, I don't feel that bad about it, but it's always a little bit morally shady to me when things like this happen, especially to people that we know for sure, for sure, would 100% hate it. If she saw that anywhere, she would be petrified. And these, as we know, were the most intimate of writings she could ever procure. So I do think it's an important like historical text at this point. And it's going to be easier to read it the more time goes on. But for now, just knowing that this is something that she had to deal with her whole life, just getting sold, being used as a product, being exploited 
it's, it just seems like a continuation of that for some reason to me. And even though I just read those texts to you, because I do think it's important to learn who she actually was and to learn that she wasn't this stupid, dumb blonde. Like she had deep insight. She had incredible talent, even, I would say. Not all of these writings, I feel like, are exquisite, but a lot of them, especially those written when she was married to Arthur Miller, they are, I think they're like really good poetry and not only that but they also give you a glimpse of her that otherwise we would never get there is some interviews of course that we can read but who cares about those like those are not real anyway there is nothing that is more real than those texts that we've just read there is nothing that gets closer to how she looked at the world how she felt than those texts so i think in that aspect it is morally acceptable, but I do not stand people that turn it into profit. I think, to be honest, the best way to go around it would be to make these texts public domain so they wouldn't directly profit off of her, but they could still share her works with the world. I feel that way about a lot of historical people, not even historical, but people from recent history that we know for sure would not be happy about their private writings being sold, but that we could still benefit from reading those writings. I think that's the morally <laughs> correct way to go around it, is just share it for free. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I think that that's my thought. <laughs> That's my reasoning, which is probably not correct either, but that's just how I feel about it. I'm just looking at a photo of her and she just looks so, so lovely. And like, I just don't want to do anything that she wouldn't like. Like, Marilyn, please don't hate me. But I just, I just wanted to share with people what you were really like. Anyway, let me know what you thought about this episode, whether you knew at all that she was writing things like that, whether you ever saw her in this light or whether you just imagined her to be completely different. Because when I first read those, this is kind of what I felt. Like I thought, wow, this is actually not what I expected these to be. I thought it's going to be things like, oh, I look so fat in this dress, like... What am I going to do? <laughs> but that's because of the persona that the media created of her. That's because all of the roles that we remember. And it's also sad because she has done so much more than just the famous comedy roles. Like she was a very versatile actress. She's done a lot of work that has nothing to do with like the dumb blonde persona. But those are just not very famous. Those are not famous movies. Those are not famous roles of her. And only when, when you start delving into her film Demography, do you even realize that she played murderers she played crazy women she she did it all and it's just such a pity that they didn't give her more roles like this because I think she would really blossom in more dramatic roles anyway these are all my thoughts on the matter <laughs> so um, yeah thanks for listening and I'll hear you in another episode bye